internally get anxious <laughs> will the screen share will this happen will that happen it just happens so would you like to wait a couple of minutes as people join yeah, yeah, yeah. no problem i mean no hurry okay <laughs> Uh, it's 3.30, so uh, maybe I will start. Uh, welcome back um, to everyone. And I know we've had a bit of a break because uh, a couple of our speakers have had uh, personal emergencies and um, or have not been able to make it for the past two weeks. And I must say how grateful I am to Dr. Anoop uh, for accepting this invitation uh, despite some constraints that he had. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, agreeing to give this talk uh, and um, sharing your knowledge with us. So um, let me briefly introduce uh, Dr. Anup to all of you. Uh, he, sir has an extremely impressive and very interesting background. So Dr. Anup Kumar Dhar is a professor of philosophy at the Ambedkar University, Delhi. Um, he is also the director of the Center for Development Practice. Uh, he was uh, a medical profession, an allopathic physician, um, and then uh, he had completed his studies and then chosen a different track. Uh, he was also a left political activist. Post-structuralist critiques of mental health took him to psychoanalysis, and post-colonial critiques of the left took him to a rethinking of Marxism. He has to his credit nine books and monographs and has published more than 70 papers uh, uh, in such prestigious journals as the Cambridge, Cambridge Journal of Economics, etc. Uh, some books that he has co-authored include The Indian Economy in Transition, Globalization, Capitalism and Development, published by the Cambridge University, and World of the Third and Global Capitalism Between Marx and Freud by Macmillan Publishers, and it's forthcoming as of now. He is currently working on an annotated edition of the English writings of Girindra Shekhar Bose, titled Aboriginal Psychoanalysis, and uh, a, a co authored book in Bengali, which translates as The Past and the Future of the Political. He is a member of the editorial board of Rethinking Marxism and is section editor of Remarks. Uh, he is the editor of the Journal of Practical Philosophy and also of CUSP. Uh, a journal of studies in culture, subjectivity, and psyche. Uh, with this uh, introduction, uh, thanks a lot, sir, once again for agreeing to be here, and I hand the uh, hand the platform over to you. And uh, we will have about an hour, right, to have this discussion. And yes. Let me see. I'll try my best to do it within an hour. Um, I'll share uh, the screen now. I think. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, we have a screen. Okay, I have to have to make it full screen. Just a second. Yes. It's there. It's full screen now, right? I can also see some of you at least. Uh, mm, yeah. Um, the, the discussion today is titled uh, The Couch and the Method, and uh, that came from your side. Uh, the title did not come from my side. I have only added the subtitle, uh, From Mirror to Canvas, uh, from kind of a mirror of being uh, to the canvas of being. Now, what do I mean by that? How do we go about uh, thinking through? Uh, this question and what does it do to philosophy, to the question of self, and to the question of consciousness. So that would be where I would want to 
uh, reach actually in this one hour that uh, what would this do to philosophy um, and uh, notions or ideas of the self and uh, the conceptualization of consciousness what what would it do uh, so uh, I start with uh, how the title has been uh, framed, uh, the couch and the method, the method and the couch. Uh, and um, this is um, famously the, the consulting room of Sigmund Freud. Um, and uh, if you can see my cursor, uh, this is the couch. This is the couch. And uh, the analyst, Sigmund Freud, uh, seems to sit at the head end of the couch and behind the patient, kind of. Uh, uh, the, I will call, call the patient analyzing today, not patient. Uh, we have patients in medicine, but not in psychoanalysis. Uh, and uh, if the analyzant is here, the analyst is seated somewhere here. So they're not sitting kind of face to face. And most of our interactions from teaching to the political are largely face to face. We face each other. We speak to each other facing each other. Uh, even the doctor patient relationship is face to face. We we uh, see each other. Um, here, uh, first, the room is dimly lit. And that is important, actually. Why is it dimly lit? Uh, why is it not lit up like an operation theater? Uh, is it less oculocentric? That's a question we'll have to think. Uh, is, is seeing the, the uh, uh, minor minor part or or there is an interesting footnote to this is it a different kind of seeing it is not the kind of seeing that we are accustomed to in medicine and where uh, seeing is very very important say for example an x-ray uh, an ophthalmoscope a laryngoscope uh, it's it's a scopic regime if i may put it that way where uh, seeing is fundamental what is the role of seeing over here? Or is it a different kind of seeing? And, and that could be thought through over here, actually. Um, um, and including uh, the, the important question, who sees? Um, uh, in the doctor-patient relationship, it's the doctor who tends to see, maybe see more than the patient, uh, see into the patient's organs, etc. Um, uh, at a time when we are doing uh, lung uh, CTs, um, the doctor is seeing into the patient's lungs. Uh, uh, but here, who sees? Is it the doctor who sees or is it the analyzant who sees? And one very important point over here is that Sigmund Freud himself was a doctor. And here is a doctor who gives birth to a different and a new methodology called psychoanalysis. And in that sense, uh, what is Sigmund Freud's movement from medicine to psychoanalysis? That's important. Okay. Uh, so uh, a dimly lit room and there's a couch. Um, the, the process is a conversation and uh, some things are happening in this setting. Let me call it a setting from now on. I'll call it an analytic setting. Okay. Um, and why has this, uh, this setting been thought is the important question over here. That why Sigmund Freud, who had a patient's table and would tend to see, generates engenders things through a very different setting what is there in us that necessitated this setting and this this methodology what is in us uh, how are we 
disposed that it required a different setting. What was the need for it? A setting different from the accustomed setting of Sigmund Freud. He was already accustomed in a setting, and that is the medical setting. It, it's called it's called the bedside bedside method. Uh, uh, how does a doctor operate? Operate in a larger sense, not just operation. Uh, how does a doctor operate? There's a method there, and there's actually a book. All of us had to read it during our MBBS. It is it is Hutchinson's uh, clinical method. Clinical method. So so one had to one had to learn that what is clinical method. And Sigmund Freud is trained in this method. Which method does he birth as he moves to psychoanalysis or? what gets birthed he doesn't do it you know with a with a conscious intention something gets birthed in the process which method what method gets birthed and why did it get birthed and what that birthing does to philosophy is the larger question the question that i ask over here today is what is there in the human subject what is uncanny about the human subject that it required a setting different from that of medicine, birthed in the hands of a doctor? And sometimes I tend to say that there must have been a hundred or maybe a thousand doctors in Vienna, all continued with their method. One broke away. That mad one is Sigmund Freud. So in that sense, what is it that made him break away from the established medical method? What were his questions? What were his patients bringing to him that required a departure, a methodological departure? Let us take this as the question and see uh, what is there, what is there in the in the human subject that necessitated a methodological departure. And of the hundred doctors in Vienna, one made that methodological departure. That one is Sigmund Freud. Given this, let's come to the next slide. And I will spend a little time discussing the human subject. Who is this human subject? Who are we? What was, what was so different or special about us that necessitated Sigmund Freud's methodological departure? Otherwise, he would have been forgotten by now as Dr. Freud, one of the hundred doctors. Uh, in that sense, um, the first problematic that I present to you, um, and it will come a little later in the slides, but it's okay, it's important to mark it because we have begun in this manner. Um, and this is actually Freud's aphasia book. Um, when a patient had aphasia, we could locate a lesion in the brain. And some of us may have heard this also, Broca's area, Wernick's area, something in the brain. And Sigmund Freud encountered a patient who had aphasia, but there was no lesion in the brain. And this opened up a question for him. How can aphasia happen without a lesion in the brain. Where is the lesion then? Where is the cause? Where is the injury? Where is the trauma? Is it psychic? Is it in childhood? Is it in our growing up years? Such that he had to move causality from organic causality to psychic causality. And really think 
how do we generate a method to understand psychic causality of loss of speech rather than organic causality of loss of speech in in today's words let me put it this way how does one mark the organic causality of loss of smell and covid we can mark it actually today but what if somebody doesn't have covid and has loss of smell there the question would be where is the causality of this loss of smell and take loss of smell metaphorically robustly over here okay that that one then would have to think the psychic causality for that loss of smell or smelling too much i'm smelling a rat either i'm smelling too much or i'm smelling too little what is the psychic causality other than the organic causality today that is around us covid let me start with the human subject in psychoanalysis the contention is that and take this take this one this triangle over here as the four legged mammal all human infants are a four legged crawling mammal and the question to psychoanalysis was how does this four legged naked mammal who has no shame how does this entity become a human subject and that is the movement this is the movement you can see the arrow over here and this is the movement how does it become a human subject with at least two very important experiences shame and guilt and the question to psychoanalysis to sigmund freud was how does a crawling four legged mammal become a human subject this register s to s prime is the register of language and if i could do it in a three dimensional way i can't do it over here the plane of language would be a plane like this and the human Uh, and the four legged mammal as if passes through the plane of language like this passes back through it and hangs from the plane of language like a human subject so look at this in a three dimensional way this diagram and and what happens over there so what does language do to us in terms of our movement from a four legged mammal without shame to a human subject a social subject with shame and guilt and i'll add a third one the incest taboo this necessitated a deeper rethinking of the subject and i'm continuing with my slide it's all titled uncanny subject uncanny is unfamiliar has also familiar for the time being but let us foreground the unfamiliar for the time being okay the unfamiliar subject the unfamiliar within us and here the important point that psychoanalysis marks is that the subject grows in an environment the infant initially it is the mother and and let's not make it too temporal like that initially it's the infant mother diet the logic of the infant mother diet and the other logic that is at work is the insertion of the paternal principle the father's rule the father's no the father's law 
what should be done, what should not be done. And the infant initially who has no shame and who would actually uh, not have the distinction of space would be trained into marking distinctions. This is where I sleep. This is where I pee. So there would be actually trainings in the infant's life that would not necessarily expand the infant's freedom, but constrict the infant's freedom. Our usual understanding is that our freedoms open up, they expand as we go along in life. Psychoanalysis has a very, very contrary notion of freedom. The infant's freedom is infinite. The infant doesn't distinguish. The infant's freedom is increasingly curtailed and weaning, taking the infant away from the mother is the first act where the infant's infinite freedom is constrained, constricted. And this philosophy of the self runs contrary to the standard philosophy that our freedoms are getting expanded. Psychoanalysis propounds a philosophy of the self or a philosophy of the subject, actually a philosophy of the subject, uh, where freedoms are constricted. Hence the thought of repression. Hence the thought of repression. That freedoms have got constricted, constrained. And the ultimate unfreedom is the six by three grave in which we will be placed. And this is a very different conception of the subject. The subject as if doesn't add. It's not plus one, plus one, plus one. The subject starts with a minus one, loss of the mother. and moves through repeated minus one. The ultimate minus one is the grave. So the subject, the human subject, the movement from the four-legged mammal to the human subject is a movement to a logical minus one. Is the movement to a logical negative. It's a movement to a logical no. No, you can't do this. In that sense, the movement from the four-legged mammal to the human subject is a movement from an infinite freedom to a constriction of freedom to at least a logical minus one. And if that is the case, that is the subject that comes to the clinic or the analytic setting. And one has to think a method to deal with this originary lack or loss. And in that sense, Sigmund Freud started with the triangle, the infant, the mother, the father, or significant others who bring us up, okay? Who, who rear us, who, who, who make us who we are, who even touch our bodies. 
It's the caregivers who touch us for the first time. And, and this process produces significant effects on us in terms of even producing the morphology of our bodies. As if there are originary impressions, as if there are originary marks. This is a different marks, M-A-R-K-S. And this subject comes to the analytic setting. And Sigmund Freud wanted to produce a thinking for this subject. And what he saw in the analytic setting, and this I'm just opening up, we'll work on this further. What, what he saw in the analytic setting was that it was not just me and the patient. So it was not a medical situation. It was not just me, the doctor and the patient. It was not just Sigmund Freud and the patient. There were two more entities or registers in the room. So empirically, when we look at the analytic setting, you see two people in the room. But his significant intervention and later, uh, Jacques Lacan made the most of it, this intervention, was that no, although we could see two people in the room, there were, there were at least four in the room. Who are the other two? And hence, this triangle, if I, if I superimpose it over here like this, it is there, of course, it is there, this triangle is there. But this triangle is as if extended with those dots into another register. And hence, we don't have two entities, A and A prime in the analytic setting, though empirically, it shows two people in the room, but there are two other entities in the room. This one is the subject of the unconscious, and we'll work on this a little more. And this one is the other. So we don't have two people in the room, though it looks that there are two people in the room. And one set of conversation is going on between these two, and there is another set of conversation that is going on between the subject of the unconscious and the other. Which other, which subject of the unconscious, we'll see. We'll see as we go along. Uh, but the main point over here is that there are no two people in the room, there are four. Two are the person of the analyst and the person of the analyzer. The two persons seated in the room. And if you extrapolate, this is true not just of the analytic setting, this is true of all relationships. This is true of all human interaction. It looks like there are two persons seated in where? Coffee day. But actually there are four. There is the subject of the unconscious and the other at work as if secretly. Wait, why is my slide not moving? Ah, it's moving, yeah. Uh, don't worry about imaginary symbolic over here. We can ignore that for the time. Uh, and this is now looked at more closely. It's called the Z schema. Uh, and uh, in the Z schema, you have the person of the, you have the person of the analyst and the person of the analyzant in this register. But what is important is the subject of the unconscious and the big other, big other. We'll come to this, hold on to this. The only problem we have now encountered is that there are no two, there are four. 
And there are no two in the analytic setting only. There are four in all human interactions. And hence, human interaction, human communication may have to be rethought. And as you can sense now, the theory of the self is being as if replaced by a theory of the subject that is more complex. And as I started with the aphasia case, where there is no organic lesion, there is a psychic lesion perhaps, the understanding is that if the person of the analyst and the person of the analyzant have a long, real, authentic conversation between them for very, very long. And if the past is remembered, and if the past is deconstructively remembered, with all the cracks in the wall, slowly the subject of the unconscious and its relationship with the other would come to the foreground. And if you are finding this other a little abstract now, let me write it as mother, but put the M in parenthesis. The mother other. So the understanding is that we need a real authentic conversation. And the fundamental problem of modernity at least is that we have no conversations. The deeper problem is that we have no conversations with ourselves. Even if we are talking all day, even in all the cacophony, what is not happening is conversation with oneself. That setting with the couch offered a space first to free associate, talk about anything, talk about everything, and a non-judgmental listener. None of us are hard of hearing, but most of us are hard of listening. And here was a non-judgmental listener. I call this person the analyst. A non-judgmental listener. And I'll call the patient from now on analyzant, and we'll see why we are calling the person analyzant. The analyzant lying on the couch is not addressing the analyst, though most analyzants tend to address the analyst at the beginning, because our general tendency is always to talk to others and not talk to oneself. And in that sense, first, the analyzant on the couch would tend to talk to the analyst, the person of the analyst. But slowly, the person on the couch will perhaps begin to talk to oneself. So there is no need to sit face to face. There is no need to see each other. We are moving from the ocular to the oral. Hearing, listening, and by speaking, the person of the analyzant is actually listening to herself as well. We are hearing our own voice. And here is a space that is created within modernity, enlightenment modernity, for us to hear ourselves. One may call it our inner voice. And hence, I have subtitled it the mirror of being. Our usual conversations are all to blame others. What is it to talk to oneself? 
our usual propensities are to go around with a torchlight or a searchlight. What is it to have a mirror in front of oneself in which I see myself? And this is that different seeing. It's not the medical seeing of an ophthalmoscope. It is a very different ophthalmoscope. What is it to have a mirror in front of oneself, a mirror of being, if I may put it that way, in which one sees oneself, perhaps for the first time, in a prolonged, sustained, protracted way, for maybe two years at a stretch, I'm looking at myself. And that looking at oneself is producing reflection in me. I'm thinking. I'm thinking about myself. And that thinking could produce a need to transform myself. That self-knowledge could take me to self-transformation. In that sense, it is a movement from the mirror of being to the canvas of being. A canvas around which I repaint, redraw myself and my relationships with the other. There is a problem, however. The problem is that the human psyche is like an iceberg. Only one eleventh of it is above water. And ten eleventh of it is below water, beyond me, beyond my objective self gaze. There are things I don't know about myself. And I may do my best to not know them. And you can now sense here is a different theory of the self. The self is not self-transparent. The self is not transparent to us. There is an obduracy, there is an uncanniness, there is a secrecy. And there is a turning away, there is disavowal, there is a resistance to know what is there in the 10-11. Sorry, 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 I was here, yeah. There is another problem, and I don't have the time today. I think I have 20, 25 more minutes, right? Uh, it's 4.10. Uh, I can't see the time because my uh, <laughs> screen yeah. is covered. Yeah, huh? It's it's 4.10 now. Uh, yeah. Another 25 minutes. Another yes, yes, yes. 4, 4.35 I'm supposed to end, right? Huh? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, no, I, I, I think I'll be able to do it. It's looking possible now. <laughs> Initially, I was anxious. Um, so, uh, let me come to another problematic. Um, and uh, this, is a, this, is, this, is, this is a little, little uh, 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 complex. Um, uh, what, what has been done over here is that uh, I will I will uh, put put the uh, diagram in in place. Uh, here is a flower vase that has been pasted or something like that uh, upside down, and here are flowers, and we well know already, if we look at it in a plain mirror, what we are going to see. What 
Lacan did, building on Daniel Lagashe, is that another mirror, which is curved, was added here. So you have a plain mirror here, and you have a curved mirror here. And now this is the eye, and take the eye robustly. It's E Y E and I. And the eye over here sees an image very different from what is in reality. Here, the flower has been uncannily as if inserted inside the vase. Let's not get in the optics of it today. Uh, that may be done better uh, by the NIAS doctoral scholars, uh, much better than me. But let us get the philosophical logic of this. The philosophical logic of this is that what appears to us in reality could present to us in our fantasy, in our inner eye, very, very differently. At times in the form of an illusion, at the form, at times in the form of a delusion. And it is not just true of schizophrenics, it is true of all of us. All of us, hence, live beyond the reality principle. All of us live beyond the reality principle, beyond the world as it is. We create worlds. And that gives space to uncanny human proclivities like art, like literature, and why not show mix drama as well, theater as well. But this is true of all of us at the level of philosophical logic. that we sometimes end up turning the flower vase of reality and creating images for us that have tremendous pull on us, that have tremendous subject effects on us, effects as well. Wait, okay, it is good. Ah. So just a quick, quick going through. I've come to the first slide. Okay. Uh, you can see the couch, right? Huh? So now the question for us is, is the couch prior? The couch gave us insights, uncanny insights into the human subject? Or the human subject is such that it required the couch. It required a setting. It's very difficult to say it's a, it's a uh, typical chicken and egg problem in philosophy, uh, which one is prior. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, this, this dialectic, the overdetermination of these two uh, needs to be thought. What I've done up to now is the uncanniness of the subject, the movement of the subject, the presence of two more entities in the analytic setting, the analyzance unconscious, and the analyst as an abstract, depersonalized other, as if taking the place of the analyzance other. We'll come to this. We'll have to think a little bit about transference, but we'll come to this. And it's well possible, and this is what happened in the Ratman case, Sigmund Freud suddenly found 
that there were some unfamiliar responses from one of his patients he later called the rat man. And he wondered, why am I getting these responses in the clinic? And as he reflected on these responses, he found that these responses were not for Dr. Freud. These responses, responses of um, anxiety, fear, restlessness, these responses in the rat man were not responses for Dr. Freud, the person of Dr. Freud. They're as if has been simply put, I'm putting it a little simply, as if has been a transfer of the emotions. And the response is not to Dr. Freud, the person, but the response is the place Dr. Freud has taken in the rat man's life in the analytic setting. The rat man's unconscious, and we are now getting the subject of the unconscious. The rat man's unconscious is now as if in conversation with the transferential father, the father of childhood, the menacing father of Ratman's childhood, the threatening father of Ratman's childhood, the subject of the unconscious is now as if in conversation with the father. And Sigmund Freud, Dr. Freud, has as if taken the place of the father. It's a placeholder. So while we began with Sigmund Freud and, quote unquote, the rat man, the rat man as if had slowly moved and shifted and come to speak, not to Freud, not to Dr. Freud, but the subject of the rat man's unconscious speaking to the rat man's other, the father. And Sigmund Freud is as if holding that place. Hence the analyst has got depersonalized. I had written in the abstract, what are the three positions the analyst the analyst takes in the analytic setting. The second position, the first position is the person of the analyst, Dr. Freud. The second position is the depersonalized position and the analyst is as if coming to now occupy the place of the father. A childhood trauma is as if getting repeated. And through that, the, the rat man may find out why is my unconscious like this? The architecture of my unconscious, the singularity of my unconscious. And what is the cause of that? What is the object cause of that? What caused it? We'll see this a little bit as we go down. The next one we have already done. Now this is clearer actually, because the S position we now get and the A position, the big A we now get. And this, this is uh, quickly put, I'm putting it a little simply, the transferential situation. So initially it's Dr. Freud and the, the rat man, but increasingly it is the rat man's unconscious. And the unconscious is a subject, not conscious subject, the subject of the unconscious. And the father, other, and Dr. Freud taking that place. Hence, psychoanalysis is about self-knowledge. It is about truth. It is about singular truth. My truth, not generalized universal truth my truth and based on my truth how do i live so there is no generalized rule to live 
it is based on the question, what is my singular truth? And then the Socratic question, the question of practical philosophy, how do I live? What self-transformations are required? So we move from the mirror of being to the canvas of being. You have done the unconscious. Hence, there is an unknowability thesis over here. There is also a thesis of the self over here that says the self is running away from itself. Let me just put it this way. The self is running away from its self-truth. Or from the truth of the self or what I wrote uh, in the abstract, the truth of one's being. The role of illusion. And last. Just, uh, yeah, I have 12 minutes. We'll, we'll, we'll manage. This then raises questions regarding methodology. Now, if the subject is doing two things, one driven by motivated irrationality rather than only rationality, driven by the 1011th underwater, unknown to itself, the unconscious. And three, if the subject doesn't want to get better. And there's a fundamental difference with medicine. In medicine, the subject comes wanting to get better. Here, the subject comes wanting to run away from the truth. The deeper epistemological question over here is, how will the subject get a glimpse of its own truth. The idea that Sigmund Freud proposed was that dreams, and I'm only foregrounding dreams today, dreams, and that's the dream book interpretation of dreams, 1900. Dreams are our royal road to the unconscious. It is dreams that will take us, give us a glimpse of who we are. But then how does one know dreams? Dreams will get narrativized, put to language, put in language, and they will lose color. So you cannot work with dreams. You can only work with the narrative of dreams. And how does one work on language? And this opens up the, the, the huge language question in psychoanalysis, which I can't get into today. How does one know? And there is an epistemological hurdle over here. How does one engage with the unconscious? It expresses itself momentarily, like a pulsation in slips of tongue, in parapraxis, in jokes in stereotypes and in dreams. So you need a long, real conversation. And there's a possibility that one would get a glimpse of it. There would also be an ontological hurdle. And these are the two problems in methodology. I'm not getting into the ethics of psychoanalysis. That is seminar seven by Lacan some other day. But there are epistemological and ontological hurdles. I'll quickly do the ontological hurdle. Uh, time, okay. Um, we will go into one case of Sigmund Freud for three minutes, maybe. The case is the Wolfman case. As you can see, the Wolfman's magic word. That's not the case, of course, that there is 
uh, and Nicholas uh, Abraham and Mari Torok's rewriting of the Wolfman case. You can see the book. Uh, that is Wolfman with his sister, uh, Pankiev, P-A-N-K-I-E-V, uh, Sergei. Uh, and that is the dream, this one. The Wolfman had a dream of six or seven wolves on a tree. And the Wolfman uh, was very, very, very young, infant, uh, no, beyond infancy, actually, a child, a child. Um, and has this dream of six or seven wolves and is scared and uh, the wet nurse consoles him, takes care of him. His mother is uh, quite unwell and cannot really look after him so much. Um, uh, the wolfman reportedly comes to Sigmund Freud with the dream in one of the sessions. This was not his presenting complaint, but this came down the line. And uh, as you can now already see, Dr. Freud is not Dr. Freud. Dr. Freud is the father for the rat man, as you have already seen, with respect to the subject of the unconscious. Sigmund Freud took off in the right direction. The wolf is not a wolf. The wolf is a representation. And this has been critiqued by Deleuze and Guattari um, in Anti-Oedipus, but I cannot get into that today. Uh, the wolf is not the wolf. The wolf is a representation. And Sigmund Freud thought um, the wolf is a father representative, the menacing, threatening father representative. He was perhaps wrong. And there's no problem in being wrong. Only those who think can be wrong. Those who follow cannot be wrong. Given this, this dream was later revisited by, by Abraham, Thorok, and Derrida in this book, Cryptonomy. And there, they made six important. They engender a very different question in the book. The question is not wolf. The question is how many. Now, that's quite crazy, actually. How many wolves? One would say, how does it matter? And their rereading of the case took them to the understanding that there were six wolves. And our usual relationship with six, and this is what we do in school, six. We write S-I-X above and put a six below. However, their methodology took them to something very, very different. And you can read it below. The expression pack of six in the Wolfman's narrative took them to Sixta, Sheshtarka, sister in Russian. Wolfman was Russian, which gives the conclusion to them that his sister is placed at the center of his trauma. I hope we have seen it. Our conventional understanding of six is this. And this is what we, what we do in school. Apple, apple, banana, banana, six, six. But just like apple can become apple of my eye, six in the wolfman's dream could refer, refer to sister. And this work needs to be done in the analytic setting. So it has to work through, work through the transparent, the obvious. Six is six, no. 
And that work is methodologically important. I'll end now. Okay, I am on time. Uh, this is what happened in Germany and France. We also tried to think that psychoanalytic methodology very, very closely in our world from the 1920s. And I will, I will not have the time to get into it, but let us at least end with this footnote. That, it's, that this methodology and the philosophy of the subject or self, if you want, want to call it self, um, I wouldn't. Uh, 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 the methodology and the philosophy, uh, uh, the, the, let, me, let me put it this way, the logic of the method uh, and the philosophy of the self was not just thought in Germany and France. It was thought in very interesting ways in our part of the world. And I'm just offering a glimpse of it. It was not thought only in Calcutta, please. Let us not make that mistake. It was thought in Lahore, it was thought in Karachi, it was thought in Bombay. Uh, and this is the place uh, where some of it was thought. The Psychoanalytic Clinic by Girindra Shekhar Bose um whose writings pushya i'm collating okay his english writings i'm collating um and uh this is actually his residence in calcutta uh and uh, i i myself took these photographs and uh, this is where the uh, psychoanalytic processes were rethought uh, this is the clinic actually where you can see that uh, figure. Uh, and this is Girindra Shekhar Bose, again a doctor, passed medicine in 1910, did psychology in 1917, practiced psychiatry and psychoanalysis, uh, wrote uh, his doctoral thesis called The Concept of Repression, his market, The Concept of Repression. Okay, and he was questioning the concept. He wrote his own dream of books, Swapna, as you can see, 1928. Uh, Lal Kalu is a literary novel. Um, it's written in the model of the Mahabharata. It's a battle between red ants and black ants. Uh, he wrote a commentary on the Puranas, a 600 page Bhagavad Gita's rewriting and the Yoga Sutra by Patanjali and, and some more works. But the most important work perhaps, but maybe who am I to say most important, uh, is a new theory of mental life. He offered to Sigmund Freud and he was in conversation with Sigmund Freud. They had a long, long exchange of letters between 1920 and 1930. And he um, offered to Sigmund Freud and to the world a new theory of mental life, not the theory Freud had proposed. So it's not this that this methodology was thought only there, it was thought in different parts of the world as well. The last slide. Uh, what does this do to the relationship between philosophy and psychoanalysis? Does it make us rethink the self as also menaced by the subject of the unconscious. Does it make us rethink our relationship with reason as also madness? I haven't called madness unreason. I have called madness madness. And what is philosophy's relationship with madness? Did we hand over madness to the psychological sciences? How does philosophy host madness? Where is the madness of philosophy? How will we host the subject of the unconscious or the philosophy of the unconscious? And this opens up a host of questions for us. 
that pertains to the relationship between philosophy and psychoanalysis. One way is to do philosophy as it is and have madness and the unconscious in the psychological clinic or the psychiatric clinic. The other is to rethink philosophy in terms of the unconscious and in terms of its lost relationship with madness. And psychoanalysis of the psychoanalytic method, the couch and the method, or the method and the couch, and the movement of the subject from the mirror of being to the canvas of being is an invitation perhaps, 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 to philosophy to set up an engagement. Um, I really have uh, no words, sir. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Um, it was deeply introspective for me in the sense, I mean, I don't know whether it was you, your words, the slides. It was almost like I was taken on a journey through this presentation. And uh, I, I mean, I, I'm afraid of breaking the spell of <laughs> the presentation by talking too much. So without uh, further ado, yeah, please. Uh, the session is open for further questions. And um, yeah, uh, please uh, raise your hands. I mean, I'm sure you're all function, uh, familiar with where the raise hand function is. And uh, I'll unmute you. Yeah, uh, Kanchal has a question. Please, please go ahead. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful talk. Um, uh, first, uh, I would just like uh, you to not just clarify as such, but to understand uh, what self-transformation is so that we can understand better how, like you said, self-knowledge uh, self can lead to self-transformation. Uh, because that we can see there is a, I mean, maybe Ramana Maharshi is who am I then, where these methods come from, where they are from spirituality or where they are in psychoanalysis or their literature that if we don't fragment it and understand, try to understand the whole, then how do we perceive it? important question actually i did not touch upon it uh, would we take more questions or do them one by one um so maybe uh, i don't see any other hands up there are some questions in the chat box after you answer this i can go to those sir. or would you prefer to have more questions asked usually that's how we do let us reflect on this see huh? uh, not that i have answers um see uh, First, though, one important point you are opening up is that uh, um, self-transformation is not the prerogative, that is not the sole uh, property of psychoanalysis. Philosophy uh, has had a history, and which I'm calling practical philosophy nowadays. Okay, uh, um, has had a has had a long history of of uh, opening up the question, how does one live? So the question is not what the world is, but also who am I and how do I live? And this is that old Socratic question, actually. Uh, um, uh, and, and, in, and, in, and, in, and in Greek uh, uh, life worlds, it took the form what Foucault calls scare of the self. That this was a question that uh, philosophy, philosophy uh, was not to know the world. Philosophy was an exercise, uh, and 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 I, I I tend to give this as an example. Say 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 uh, somebody who does kasrat, a, a gymnast, a dancer. Uh, these are exercises, and these exercises transform us. These exercises make us. We become through these exercises. Philosophy as a process of becoming rather than a process of knowing, merely knowing. And uh, Foucault has a beautiful line in Hermeneutics of the Subject. Uh, he says that 
this preoccupation of Greek philosophy, and he looked at the Greek, but now a um, uh, 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 number of others have shown that this, this was also a preoccupation in Indian philosophy. Okay, and um, uh, uh, what, what, what opens up over here is that that old Socratic question, uh, and it's not merely Socratic, please, that is very important. The same question was asked elsewhere as well, uh, maybe asked more strongly, more profoundly, uh, more persuasively elsewhere, not just in Greek. Uh, and this question Foucault says in hermeneutics of the subject, uh, we don't have the time to share that quote. He says that this was revived. This was revived in modernity in psychoanalysis. This old Socratic question of rethinking, how does one live? And hence the self-transformation as an exercise, just like we do physical exercise. Uh, a gymnast does it. Uh, so uh, it is there in philosophy as well. It is there in spirituality as well. Uh, which spirituality is again a question, okay? Uh, spirituality uh, that is adjacent to religion or spirituality that is adjacent to philosophy. Over the years, I have developed my doubts regarding uh, with spirituality. Okay, uh, so we have uh, one kind of spirituality and self transformation, which is more, um, more systematized. Let me put it this way, uh, which uh, uh, which is more adjacent to religion, closer to religion, and there is uh, uh, perhaps a spirituality. Not perhaps uh, one can show it also. Uh, that is, that is adjacent to philosophy. Philosophy's uh, Socratic preoccupation, old preoccupation, old philosophy, not new philosophy. Old philosophy, medieval philosophy, uh, where the question is one of self-transformation. Now, concretely one line, just the last line. In the psychoanalytic setting and in that process, one may, through self-knowledge, come to a realization uh, uh, that, that um, this part in me needs to transform. For example, I'm giving you the simplest one. My extreme hate for the mother requires a little mitigation because there are deconstructive cracks in my narrative, in the seamlessness of my narrative, in the seamlessness of my division. And if such divisions are problematized, binaries hyphenated, then we begin to see the world very differently. In that sense, the uh, singular preoccupation is not with social transformation, the, the uh, 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 question of social transformation is also related to self-transformation. So uh, Kanjan, I don't know whether I have answered your question, but I have merely reflected on it uh, and spirituality remains an important part uh, for me over here. Uh, I'm a student of spirituality only. So I'm trying to understand it uh, and have come to it late um, as a Marxist, uh, in my student days, my arrival was rather delayed to spirituality, which is my limitation, perhaps. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are two more questions. Um, uh, one from uh, Varun and from Sanjana. I'll, um, Varun, please go ahead. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Thank you so much for this lecture, sir. I have two questions. One is pertaining to uh, the larger sort of discourse of psychoanalysis itself. Like there are recently there have been critiques from the neuroscientific perspective 
uh, if you would look at uh, the likes of neuro philosophy of paul churchland and eliminative materialism where they they in a way try to say that not specifically to psychoanalysis but so many different branches of psychology they say it's folk psychology and yes. which is in some way manifest image and which we should get rid of because uh, we are into this brave world where we should be looking into the neurophysiology rather than into the uh, you know these uh, manifest image in some sense and then there is this this critique of psychoanalysis by a famous critique by frederick crews where he outrightly says that freud was in some sense a fraud and making of an illusion and that sort of a critique so how can you uh, how, what are your perspective regarding these critiques and uh, secondly my question is related to the the formerly asked question of spirituality uh, i've read your works on uh, marxism and spirituality and uh, the interview that you took of uh, the lai lama and i was really i really liked that uh, understanding of yours but uh, how do you see the intervention of jungian uh, psychology uh, when you compare it with the uh, freudian perspective do you think jungian psychology has more insights as compared to freudian perspective when it comes to a question of spirituality so yeah these are my two questions thank you very important questions uh, actually see first to uh, for a critique of freud you just have to go to wittgenstein so uh, uh, you have you have him only uh, critiquing sigmund freud and a, and a, and, a, and a very very incisive critique i must admit ah uh, number 1 number 2 i am no defender of sigmund freud today if it looked like i was defending it was because uh, i was told to speak on the uh, couch and the method um i am myself a critic of sigmund freud. and i'm saying it when it's being recorded i know um but but my critique is a deconstructive critique will my critique lead me to completely abandon give up to make a clean distinction between what is usable and what is not or my critique would be a deridian critique a deridian deconstructive relationship with psychoanalysis Uh, here, uh, mark this phrase. It's from Spivak. One cannot not want psychoanalysis. One cannot not want psychoanalysis because it offers us something interesting about us, something uncanny about us. Do we need to still engage with it? Number one. Number two. Number three. uh there have been critiques from neuro uh, from uh neurobiology uh i used to read uh, uh churchland a lot uh, once upon a time but of late i haven't read so i shouldn't comment on it number 1 uh, uh 3a 3b uh you will find a defense of psychoanalysis uh if you read eric candle who who is a nobel laureate so now there are people who would defend who would oppose it's like uh, whether you take the vaccine or not so um uh, in that sense uh, uh i of late not of late for the last 10 years have taken some interest in neurobiology because there are interesting insights coming up from there and there is now a branch of study uh and if i say new york i think it will convince us more uh uh it is in new york it is called neuropsychoanalysis it is to bring to dialogue the insights the contemporary insights of neurobiology and the contemporary insights of psychoanalysis we are not in any way stuck in classical freudian psychoanalysis not to give it up please okay just like we need to read marx we need to read freud the two dissenting children of western modernity so we'll join hands with the dissenters we won't give up the dissenters but that doesn't mean we will not dissent against the dissenters also okay so i'm not defending sigmund freud please i was only being um 
only being attentive to what he tried to do, to understand what he tried to do, and, and, and then see what we can do. My interest is not in the Germans and the French. My interest is what we can do. What we can do with these insights, and that is why I ended with those three slides on Girindra Shekhar Bose. He was not applying psychoanalysis on Indian analyzants. Sorry, I forgot one thing. Analyzant, why analyzant, not patient? Analyzant, that A-N-D at the end is I-N-G in French. So the analyzant is analyzing. The patient doesn't get better on her own. The doctor cures the patient. The analyzant cures herself. Uh, if there is any cure in psychoanalysis, may maybe let's call it healing. Keep it spiritual, call it healing. Uh, um, so in that sense, uh, uh, see Varun, uh, 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 there, is a, there is a branch now called neuropsychoanalysis and uh, uh, Psalms and Psalms, S-O-L-M-S. Uh, you will get the book also if you Google, S-O-L-M-S, huh? Psalms and Psalms. They have done a lot of work. Others have also done a lot of work. I'm not so much into medicine anymore. So I'm a little backdated over here. Huh? Um, and I don't read them also only for all the information I get. I try to see how there can be a dialogue, a conversation. Um, I think all our problems is because uh, dialogues have broken down. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and how, does, how does one uh, keep that alive? is one uh, uh, spirituality question why don't i forgot the spirituality question what was the spirituality question just just give me a clue in one line uh, yeah my question was uh, about the uh, comparison between freud and jung when it comes to the question of spirituality <laughs> uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah 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 absolutely absolutely uh, though Freud would not agree with Jung on his theory of dreams and his theory of the unconscious, Lacan included, okay. Uh, but but uh, please let us keep um, uh, all our options open and let us see how we can how we can uh, reach a, a kind of uh, 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 psychoanalytic practice or a practice of healing, a practical philosophy perspective. Uh, uh, consonant, consonant and consistent with our concerns and our life worries. Okay, so let us not. Uh, so I agree with you Varun, on this that uh, let us keep the opening, but today we would not be able to go into that distinction, uh, but I would be respectful of Jung's, Jung's work. Uh, so I would have some differences, but I would still be respectful of that work. Yeah. Um, so there are plenty of questions in the chat box and one hand up. Can you just give a quick answer to Sanjana and then we'll go to the chat box questions because uh -huh. we're also running out we of We have only eight minutes left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll just say yes or no from now on. <laughs> no, no, whatever uh -huh. you feel like. So Take it an MCQ. Huh. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, hi, sir. Uh, yes. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm interested in understanding conditions such as sleepwalking that lie in this very gray area of conscious and unconscious. So in the interest of time, I will keep my question brief. Uh, but so where, how must one begin to explore experiences such as this, um, especially if it's based in like personal experiences of these things? And that's, that's, that's my question. I'll keep it brief. Where must where must one begin to understand this and how must one explore this? Like, where must I look to understand this? Uh, so then I really don't have an answer to your question, actually. Actually, I don't have any answer to your question. Uh, we'll have to understand the phenomenon sleepwalking. Maybe others know better about it. Uh, my only, only response to, to what you are uh, placing before us, and it's important, actually, uh, is that uh, uh, there are uncanny physical or psychophysical, uh, psychophysical, uh, uh, psychosomatic 
uh, responses uh, from us uh, uh, and uh, they may have uh, somatic organic causality they may also have uh, psychic causality or is all causality psychosomatic so your question actually opens up a more philosophical question actually is the mind body divide wrong are all processes psychosomatic at the cusp of mind body and that hyphen so how would we understand sleep walking etc and there would be many such experiences actually uh, and and one will have to think uh, i can only think about it but i don't have uh, good reading of sleep walking so i would not venture an answer over here i would actually accept that i don't know uh, and that would perhaps be proper over here but but keep thinking about it uh, uh, we'll all do it together uh now the questions in the chat box oh my god can i just so can i just quickly go through them? yeah please 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 yeah there's one question that says could there be links to the parent adult child of transactional analysis in uh, the psychoanalysis that you presented today um that's one question uh yes. and also another question can listening okay it's an mcq uh, now na Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, no, yes. no, please go ahead, sir. <laughs> uh, another uh, question. Yeah, carry on. Can listening be active? Huh? We have to work on listening. Uh, I actually try to teach a course with some of my colleagues. Uh, uh, the course is titled uh, Listening, Relating, Communicating. where we try to work on our listening so listening can be worked upon okay we can work on our listening yes we can we can active means uh work active is work huh? there is no active passive active is work even non violence non violence is the is the biggest work i think you have got it non violence is more work so uh, passive is also work uh, uh, active is also work so i can't take the term active uh, simply okay. so it's like it's like non violence is lot of work yeah carry on sir i'll just go a uh, few more questions there are different schools of thought in psychoanalysis this is like the european uh, the united states the uk based psychoanalysis etc indian psychoanalysis is the one by girindra shekhar bose um, who has had a different way of looking at or analyzing this how do you think these schools of thought um, sorry the question is a fragment um, what But do you I think about these it. schools of thought i think okay yeah. i've got the question like in india can we say is it only limited to sudhir lakhar's way of and yeah. etc so uh, etc no 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 please uh, gorov gorov let us keep 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 openings okay uh, many many people have worked uh, i have actually um, gathered uh, all the issues of shamiksha which was the journal of the uh, indian psychoanalytic society and have scanned them put them up on the web Uh, as much as possible uh and uh, except the first volume uh which i couldn't find and you will see there are a lot of writings many many people many many analysts are writing it's not only professor kakkar professor kakkar of course is a is a very big inspiration to us uh, uh i myself um uh, has been uh, have been have been trained uh, trained inspired uh, guided by him uh but uh, i i i still would say that there are many contributions uh during the shekhar bose is one and and i hold on to my position over here we have to do our own we cannot apply what is going on in the west they made sense of their experiences and produce their methodologies it is not to not learn from them but we will have to constantly think constantly so one more question uh, from ashita 
uh, is transference necessary for transformation to take place or, or can the subject bring the unconscious to the foreground without the involvement of the other projected onto the analyst? Very, very, very good question. Absolutely, absolutely important. Uh, but uh, uh, we would not be able to fully do it today. Uh, uh, Ashita, if I'm uh, pronouncing your name right. Uh, uh, see, uh, transference will um, actually give us an insight. Where is, is the core? Uh, so that insight may be necessary and important. Okay, uh, let me let me just uh, uh, quickly put it this way. Okay, um, so uh, see, uh, um, I'm I'm remembering garam hawa. Uh, when when in partition you leave a land, uh, my parents came from East Pakistan to India, uh, and uh, when you leave land, means you are losing the big other, you sometimes carry a small stone, uh, a tulsi plant. So when we lose the other, mother other, take it as a logical step in our lives, we carry a part of the other with us, an objectral other, not the subjectral other, but the objectral other. And that objectral other produces a process, a dialectic, a vortex of desire in us. And it's important to get a sense of that. And the transferential process gives us a sense of that and an insight into that. That what is it that I have lost? And that sometimes becomes important. So, so uh, as you saw in the Wolfman case, the rereading of the Wolfman case by Derrida, uh, Abraham and Torok, uh, he, the loss of the sister was perhaps fundamental. And what is it that I'm doing today to cover that loss, to, to compensate for that loss? And here is, a, here is a very troubling question, but let me now say it. Uh, are our adult uh, findings, compensations for our infant losses? And transference gives us an insight, a clue into that loss. Now, why, why will we think life in terms of loss or think life in terms of lack is a fundamental philosophical question to psychoanalysis. But I'm not questioning that premise today. Virinder Shekhar Bose questioned that very premise, that why are you seeing the subject in terms of lack? Can we have a philosophy of the self that is not premised on a philosophy of lack, on a philosophy of originary or primal lack. And that is a very important question. But given the structure, the given structure, given the given structure, transference offers us uh, uh, an insight, an insight into, into the subject's unconscious cause of desire. Unconscious, cause of desire. We are not looking at desire. We're looking for the cause of desire. Unconscious cause of desire. That object cause of desire. Okay. Yeah. So much for now, uh, Ashita. Uh, some other day, we'll have a full discussion on transference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sir, I think we're running out of time. So quickly, uh, let me just ask uh, Vishaka Sen for a very brief uh, question or uh, um... Uh, Ashita read three thanks three a lot, ma'am. Thank you, NIST. And thank you, sir. I'm a huge fan. And I'm, I'm working on the idea of self in Sudhir Gakkar's uh, psychoanalytic theory. Uh, so oh, this... Wow. Uh, I'll, I'll tell him. <laughs> he knows, sir. Uh, uh, I met him, yes, sir. 
you met him. Oh, oh, so and, I don't uh, have to tell him. And I thank you. I thank uh, the whole team for bringing this up today. And sir, I just have one question uh, regarding Subir Kakkar of, of the topic that uh, when it comes to Subir Kakkar to choose uh, between Freudian or Ericksonian uh, psychoanalysis, uh, he tends to use use it in a very uh, balanced manner. And as it is said that psychoanalysis itself works on uncertainties and it is not there to give uh, uh, high end conclusions, but to work on these uncanny uncertainties and the gaps. So, sir, I, I want your uh, uh, opinion on uh, how uh, Indian psychoanalysis from the point of view of all the works, like your work, Salman Akhtar's work, Kakkar's work, and also others who have worked on Indian psychoanalysis, like Freud along the Ganges and uh, Vishnu on Freud's desk. So uh, can we now, are we in that state, of course not theorizing, but as you said, problematizing the Indian psychoanalysis and how far uh, Kakkar is using Erickson for that matter, because he has discussed infant, mothers, all the relationships. And that's how our Indian psychoanalysis is. That's how Giren uh, Shekhar Bose quoted Freud, that uh, we do not experience uh, the Oedipal complex. It is, it is not that. Matter. So I just want your opinion and expert uh, comments uh, for this. Thank you, sir. Uh, see, uh, uh, the interesting, interesting, uh, thing about uh, Dr. Kakkar is that he's a very, very free mind. He has no obligation to belong to any school. I have actually learned this from him. He has no obligation to be Ericksonian. He has no obligation to belong to any camp. He's an absolutely as much as he can, nobody can be absolutely free, but as much as he can, a free thinker. And I would urge us to not belong to schools because that constrain our thinking when we belong to schools. It limits thought, it limits questions. And please don't uh, uh, forget one thing, Vishakha. For at least a thousand years, we taught Ptolemy in all the churches. And everybody wrote it down as the truth. So human beings are capable of making Ptolemic mistakes for a thousand years. Hence, it's very risky to become a follower. It's better to keep oneself open for as many possibilities as possible in terms of the canvas of thought and the canvas of praxis and the canvas of possibilities. And Dr. Kakkar in that sense is a, is a very free thinker. This is what I've felt over the years as I've interacted with him. Huh? Um, um, I can't say it on record. Otherwise, uh, oh, I, I'll, I'll share it once the recording is off. Stay for a uh, half a minute. I'll share something once the recording is off. Uh, I can't really share this on record, uh, but um, he's he's free, and and I think uh, Salman Akhtar, Ashish Nandi, okay, and the many unknown, uh, less known analysts who have written in Shamiksha. I don't want to forget them. They're the margins of Indian psychoanalysis, like the margins of philosophy. Um, uh, they have also contributed in very, very important ways. Many women analysts, actually. Many women analysts who have contributed significantly to the rethinking of psychoanalysis in India, uh, including some of my colleagues, Hani Oberoi, Rachna Jauri, uh, uh, Amrita uh, in Goa, Chumadi, many in Calcutta, Pushpadi, Jainadi, okay. Uh, Many of them have contributed significantly to the rethinking of psychoanalysis as free thinkers. So uh, let us end with maybe uh, this, this need for being free in our thinking.
pushing. Um, thanks a lot, sir. I see a lot more questions uh, in the chat box. I'm sorry, we might not be able to take them today. But uh, please do mail us at the NIAS official uh, mail ID. I think we've shared that with you. Um, yeah, it's right there. So please do write to us and uh, um, we will be happy to write uh, uh, forward them to sir who can respond to them at his uh, convenience um yeah you can give my email id and i can actually write and uh, yeah i, I so, promise i'll respond huh? i promise i'll respond i may be a little slow uh, but uh, uh, okay, we will slow <laughs> simply uh, i work very slowly now uh, so, but I will definitely respond, I, I promise. Thanks a lot, sir. And um, may I just say that uh, at the end, what you said about uh, being free of following, that reminded me a lot of uh, Jay Krishnamurti's teachings, where he said, truth is a pathless land. And uh, I, um, I, I, that came back to me quite uh, poignantly and, uh, uh, so on that note, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anu, for giving us your time and uh, taking us on this journey of all experience. For giving me the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this journey of experience and introspection. Um, I think it's been deeply reflective, and I think many, many of the comments in the chat box, I didn't have time to read them out, uh, reflect that. Uh, it was so for many of the people who listened in today and tuned in. So uh, I must thank Dr. Saurabh uh, for introducing you to us and uh, also facilitating um, this talk. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Sankita Menon, who's uh, Dean and Head of the Niyas Consciousness Studies Program for yes. being the backbone of this program and uh, also conceptualizing it. Um, and I'd like to thank also my colleagues at Niyas, uh, Niharika Sharma, Ashwini, Abhishek, Meera, and all the others for their support, constant support, enthusiasm, and invaluable help, uh, especially in the background with the Zoom platform and all these complicated things <laughs> without which these sessions would not be possible. Um, I'd like to thank Nias and uh, the director of Nias for uh, facilitating and allowing such programs. And thank you all for tuning in once again, and we look forward to seeing you in the last couple of lectures of this series. So on that note, um, thank you all, and we look forward very much to seeing you uh, in the upcoming sessions. Thank you.